Today's lesson, moral of the story, happy spouse, happy house, a godly union. So, Lord willing, we're able to shed some light on marriages in Israel. There's a lot of, um, there, there's a lot of turmoil, I mean, to put it plainly, um, in a lot of Israelite marriages. And it's unfortunate, but it's it's pretty frequent, you know, um, a lot of people <laughs> talk about it. Um, I know many of brothers that deal with it. Um, I know many of sisters that deal with it and on both sides, there's parties at fault. Uh, it's not any, just one side. There are things that brothers can do better. There are things that sisters can do better. And, um, as a unit, as a whole, this is something we have to get together. We, we have to get it right. Um, so I want to go ahead. I want to grab a few scriptures first. Now let's go to Sirach. I want to go to Ecclesiasticus uh, 25 and verse 1. And then behind that, um, Azrael, can you give me Sirach 25 and 1? And Ben, can you grab Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 22? You go ahead and read that out real when you got it. It's the book of Ecclesiasticus, chapter 25, and verse 1. In three things was I beautified and stood up beautifully, both before God and men, the unity of brethren, the love of neighbors, a man and a wife that agree together. So we see here uh, in the scriptures, and we see this in a number of places when we're talking about a godly union that the Lord is ordained. One of the most beautiful things that you'll see is the unity of brethren, which is a huge deal. Um, what was the second one, Azrael? Read the second one. The second verse in Ecclesiasticus? Or... No, so, no, no, no. Just read it from the top. Come. In three things was I beautified and stood up beautifully before God and men. Right. The unity of brethren. It says the unity of brethren. Brothers that have what's called brotherly love. Brothers that can stand together. Read. The love of neighbors. The love of neighbors. Read. A man and wife that agree together. So brothers that can be unified. Not only brothers that can be unified. Neighbors, which are also brothers and sisters that have love for one another. And then it says a man and a wife that are on the same accord. There being no divisions in your marriage. That's one of the top three things that we see that a man can be beautiful. Uh, 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 an individual can stand beautifully or glorious in the eyes of the most high. This is something that the Lord looks highly on. Right. Um, let's go to Proverbs 18. Ben, you got that Proverbs 18 and 22. This is the book of Proverbs, chapter 18 and verse 22. Whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing and obtaineth favor of the Lord. It says an individual who finds a wife, it's supposed to be a good thing. It's supposed to be a beautiful thing. It says if you found a wife, you have found favor with the Lord. You have found favor with from the Lord. Let's go to Genesis 2, 2 and 24, right? So what you're going to see early on is the Lord, ha he, he looks very, very highly on a union, on a righteous union, right? Azrael, can you give me Genesis 2 and 24? This is the book of Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto the, his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Huh. So it says that when a man leaves home, when he can now start his own manly journey, start his own family, once he finds that wife, he's or wives or whatever, he shall cleave unto her. He shall cleave to this woman. That means he shall hold her tight. He shall hold her fast. He shall hold her near and dear to himself, to his heart. You guys, let, 
and, and, and excuse me, let me do with this other side. It says you guys are one flesh. What does that mean? You guys should have the same mind on a lot of things. You guys are a what's called a reflection of one another. So if, if one is showing their ass, if one is looking like a fool, guess what? The other one, people are going to look at you like, yo, what's, what's, <laughs> what's going on? You guys are supposed to be a representation of the other. You guys are supposed to be each other's better half. Ben, can you give me Sirach 36 and 24? Um, Azriel, give me Hebrews 13 and 4, please. So I want to line this up first to give you an understanding. Like the Lord, th this is a big, not, not only is it a big deal, the Lord looks at this as something that is huge, but the Lord looks at this as something that is supposed to be beautiful. There should not be any fighting. There should not be any bickering. There should not be any back and forth. There should not be any any disunity, any dis, uh, what's the word? Um, uh, disharmony. Disharmony, but it's, it's what, resentment. There should be there shouldn't be any resentment toward one another. No, none of that should be going on because the Lord said this is supposed to be a beautiful thing. This is the, the whole purpose of man and woman coming together. One of the main purposes, rather, of man and woman coming together is to start building and establishing a legacy. Well, how do you do that? One of the main ways is establishing what's called progeny, descendants, children. And that child is supposed to be raised up in this beautiful household. Them seeing what a beautiful and righteous marriage is supposed to look like. Them being raised up in harmony with their mother and their father and growing up to be a godly seed. But you can't do that if your house is broken up. So what a lot of brothers and sisters are going through is not something that we should be going through. The Lord said through, through his writers, through his scribes, through his wise men, through his prophets, Three things was I beautify. One of them is a man and a woman that agree together. Uh, Whoso findeth the wife finds a good thing and finds favor of the Lord. Genesis 2 and 24 literally tells you a man and a woman are supposed to be one flesh. They cleave together. They're supposed to be a reflection and a representation of one another. Who, who, um, read Sirach 36 and 24, whichever brother I asked to get it. Sean, this is the book of Sirach or Ecclesiasticus 36 and 24. He that getteth a wife, but getteth a possession. It says you get a possession. That's something that you now own. Just like when you have kids, that is your possession. Something you own, something you're responsible for. Something you should be taking care of. Something that you're supposed to be looking after, Read A help. <clears throat> so like a, a help like unto himself. A help. Oh, I love this part. A help like unto himself. She's supposed to be his support and his help, but she's supposed to be a reflection of him. If this man is on top of his game, if this man is thorough, if he's disciplined, if he's diligent, wife, if, if you're struggling with that, you need to step, step it up. You got to be that reflection of him, a help like unto himself. And what's the last part, Reed? And a pillar of rest. And a pillar of stress. Of rest. Read that again, Ben. And a pillar of rest. A pillar of rest. You shouldn't be stressing this man out. That should not be going on. Now, mind you, I want to. I'm going to put this out here right now. We're going to touch on both sides, right? So don't worry about it. I know a lot of times when we get into these these types of lessons, everybody pretty much knows the rest is straight down the middle. But, you know, when we get into these lessons, people start feeling, well, oh, my God, see, it's about the sisters, blah, blah, blah. Well, first and foremost, what was that, just two weeks ago where I really dug into the brothers? So let's not act like I don't I, I'm, I'm not fair. I shoot straight down the middle. But the focus right now is is literally what the scriptures are saying. When a, when a man marries a woman, there are things that she should be fulfilling. And one of those things is being his rest being his support system. What does a pillar do? A pillar literally helps to support and hold things up, keep things in place. So if you're supposed to be his pillar, you're supposed to keep that man in place. You're supposed to keep that man up. You're supposed to support this individual. 
and you're supposed to be his rest, his haven. Brothers should be getting off work like, man, I can't wait to get home, man. My, I know my wife got whatever, some some food ready. I know I know I can go there, and it's been a long, stressful day. I can go and just talk to her, and she can utilize what it is that the Lord gave her, that nurturing and nourishing spirit even on her husband, making him feel better, making him feel like he could still conquer the world. I can't wait to get home and be with my wife to be able to do that, to be able to talk to her, to be able to lay down my burdens, right? That's what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be that pillar of rest. And in being that pillar of rest, that's one of the things that you should be able to, to, to fulfill, right? Give me, um, and uh, Ben, uh, do me a favor. Hold Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 9. Uh, Azrael, read Hebrews 13 and 4. Um, book of Hebrews, chapter 13, verse 4, and it reads, Marriage is honorable in all, mm. and the bad undefiled. It says, Marriage is honorable in all. Scriptures that said again, we see how the Lord feels about a righteous union between a man and his wife. It says it's honorable in all. This is something that the Lord looks highly on and a bed undefiled. Why? Because you're not out whoremongering, because you're not out um, uh, being a harlot, being a whore. Right. This is you guys is you guys is home. You guys is union. If you guys are laying down with one another. Um, loving one another. There's nothing, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that because that is your, um, that is your lot. That is your possession. That is your, your, your gift that the Lord has given unto you, right? I'm going to get one more Ecclesiastes 9 and 9. Huh. This is the book of Ecclesiasticus <clears throat> chapter 9 and verse 9. Sit not at all with another man's wife, nor sit down with her in thy uh, uh, Ecclesiastes, not Ecclesiastes. Oh, Salakia. Ecclesiastes. This is the book. This is the book of Ecclesiastes, uh, chapter nine and verse nine. Salakia. Live joyfully with the wife whom thou loveth all the days mm -hmm. of, the, of the of the life of thy vanity. It says you guys are supposed to be living joyfully with one another. Again, our our marriages are supposed to be something beautiful. Our marriages are supposed to be something that's looked forward to. You see it all through the scriptures, how highly the Lord looks at this, how beautiful he feels a righteous union is. Right, Read, Con, which he hath given thee under the sun, all the days of thy vanity, uh huh, for that is thy portion in this life, uh huh, and in thy labor which thou takest under the sun. So he said, The Lord, the marriages, unions are something that the Lord has gifted us to be able to have. And he said, uh, Out of because uh, the whole point is this in Ecclesiastes, when you read Ecclesiastes. At the end, Solomon is basically saying nothing means nothing. All, you're going to live. You're going to die. Everyone has the same end. We're all going to die. And so the whole purpose is for us to keep these commandments because that's all the Lord really wants us to do. Right. So but the whole point he's saying here in Ecclesiastes, the life of your vanity, meaning the life of that you have, which is eventually going to lead to you dying because that's where we all end up. You can have a wife. And in having this wife, you guys should be living joyfully with one another. You guys should be loving each other and enjoying each other's presence. Your wife or wives or however many you end up having, you guys should be living and loving the hell out of one another. That's the whole purpose of you guys even getting married because why get married? If you don't, if you don't like them, if you know you're not compatible, if you know there's going to be problems because you guys don't, it doesn't make sense. So live joyfully with one another, right? Give me um, Tobit, chapter seven and thirteen, uh, Azrael, and 
been hold Exodus 22 and 16. So we're seeing, I'm, I'm trying to set it up first. We see how the Lord feels about marriages and we see how the Lord feels about what he ordains as unions. The whole purpose of this is again, happy spouse, happy house. We have a number of people. I've had conversations and counseled a number of people and on top of even my leaders about marriages that are struggling, marriages that are not happy, brothers who are not living joyfully with the wife of thy youth, sisters who are not living happily <laughs> with, with their head, with their husbands, because things are just out of order, out of whack, right? So let's get uh, Tobit 7 and 13 real quick. I want to get something established so we can just go ahead and get out of the way. Chapter 7 and verse 13, and it reads, Then he called his daughter Sarah, and she came to her father, and he took her by the hand and gave her to be wife to Tobias, mm -hmm. saying, Behold, take her after the law of Moses. Read that again. And saying, Behold, take her after the law of Moses mm -hmm. and lead her away to thy father. And he blessed them. God. So first things first. I, let's let's go ahead and get this out the way because there's, there's so many <clears throat> misunderstandings uh, when we're talking about marriage, what a marriage is, right? So Tobit 7 and 13, he said, take her after the law of Moses. Moses. Read me Exodus 22 and 16 really quickly. All right. Come. Oh. Chapter 22 and verse 16. And if a man entice a maid that is not betrothed and lie with her, he shall surely endow her to be his wife. Right. So we see here in the scriptures, if that man lays with that woman, that is what's called the sealing of that covenant if you guys have laid down with one another that is it that is all there is no oh it didn't work out oh you you making me mad so i'm a i'm i'm a go uh i'm gonna put you away I, there's no there's no oh this is just my boyfriend or this is just my girlfriend it's not it's none of that if you laid down with her that is what you are now responsible for I don't care because the Lord doesn't care how irritating she is, how much she makes you upset. None of that. I could give a damn because the Lord could give a damn. If you lay with that woman, that woman is your wife. You must fulfill your duties as a husband to her. Now, there are brothers that have different outlooks on it but i see the scriptures for what they say deuteronomy 22 says the exact same thing do me a favor um ben go to first corinthians 7 and 33 hold that and um asriel go to genesis 24 and 64 we're gonna read down to 67 so uh let's get this out the way let's get this established if you lay down with a woman it isn't oh well it's fornication we can repent from it no no no. Oh, I didn't really know her and, and I didn't think she was gonna stress me out like that. So I repented of it and 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 you know I'm just gonna go about my no, no, no. Oh, I, I was I was drunk that one day and and you know she she caught me slipping. No, no, no. And that's the brothers that say sex is marriage because you can't now put a asterisk on when sex is marriage. That you can't do that. You can't say sex is marriage, but not if uh, maybe I drank too much and then, you know, I was chilling with this chick. She wasn't that cute until I got, you know, to my third cup of Henny. And so, you know, she was, she was cool. And I, you know, I kind of lost my cool and, and, oh man, you know, I woke up and she was, you know, she was right there. She wasn't as pretty as I thought she was that, too bad. If you lay with her, that is your wife. There's no asterisk on that. There is no but if. There is no, 
uh, fine print clause at the bottom. No, if you lay with that woman, that's your wife. Let's get Genesis 24 real quick. 24, 64 through 67. Come. This is the book of Genesis, chapter 24, verse 64. And it reads, And Rebecca lift up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she lighted off the camel. For she had said unto the servant, What man is this that walketh in the field to meet us? And the servant had said, It is my master. Therefore she took a veil and covered herself. Uh -huh. And the servant told Isaac all things that he had done. And Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent and took Rebekah. And she became his wife and he loved her. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Con. So we see there, even 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 in that, and I should have gotten the one, but I don't remember exactly where it said. I should have gotten, you know, even after the wedding with uh the Rachel and Leah situation. But the same thing, once they laid down, that was it. It said they went into the tent. What what do you think they did? They went and had a notary in there and and the and the and the, the chaplain and uh, uh I forgot what they call them, um uh whatever of the of the um of the court that sat in there and said, you know, I now pronounce you husband and wife, blah, 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 fill out these documents. No. They went in there, they laid down, they sealed their covenant. They they, they had a justice of the peace ready inside the tent. Right, right, right. They they had a justice of the no, that's no. They laid down with one another and they were now married. According to the law of Moses in Exodus twenty two and Deuteronomy twenty two. So when you lay down, that's it. Once y'all lay down, y'all coming back up as one flesh. That is it, and that is all. Give me 1 Corinthians 7, and we're going to start at 33. And we're going to read down to um, 34. All right. <clears throat> so like this is the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 33. But he that is married careth, careth for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. Wait, 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 wait. Read, read that last part again. How he may please his wife. So I, I want brothers to hear that. When you become married, it's not about you. It's not about just you anymore. It says once you decide to jump the broom, make that decision that life-changing decision it's not just you anymore it says but he that is married care for the things of the world now again in context this isn't talking about you know when the scriptures talk about if you have the cares of the world then you know you don't love the father this is everything is about context he's saying you can't focus as much or excuse me on the works doing your travels and uh ministering all over the place you can't do that because something that needs to be a focus is how you will please your wife because you guys are married you guys are together there is a a, a level of due benevolence due affection due love for your wife now right reverse 34 con there is a difference also between a wife and a virgin, mm -hmm. the unmarried woman careth for the things of the Lord, mm -hmm. that she may be holy, both in body and in spirit. Mm -hmm. But she that is married careth for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. Again, so now we see it on both sides, right? It says a woman who is married cares of the things of the world how she will please or how she may please her husband so it's a give and take now understand it's not what people call a quote-unquote partnership uh, i'm going to put that out there right now but it is a give and take there is a level of compromise that needs to be had right that's just the truth so when we understand what's going on 
the Lord sees this as, as supposed to be one of the most beautiful things that a man can have on this earth. A man uh, having a wife, a woman having a husband. It's supposed to be a, a beautiful, righteous, godly union. Right. Um, and in doing so, there's a give and take that we should all be having. And so this goes for both sides. Sisters, you guys need to understand. Matter of fact, give me first Corinthians 11. And that might have been later on in the lesson, but if it's too bad, we're going we gonna to grab it now. Give me first Corinthians 11. Huh. Uh, and I want verse eight and nine. Con, this is the book of first Corinthians chapter 11 and verse eight. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. So that's talking about in Genesis. The Lord created woman from man, not man from woman. Right. Read. Neither was the man created for the woman, mm -hmm. but, but the woman for the man. But the woman for the man. Sisters were created for the brothers. When we read at the beginning, it said Adam didn't have a help that was adequate for him. So the Lord gave him Eve. It's you guys' job to be that adequate and sufficient help to us. You guys were created for us. Genesis 3, and I think it's 14, says your desire shall be toward your husband. Whatever it is that your husband requires of you, that is what you need to become for him or strive your best to become that for him. And we're going to get into both sides of the roles, playing your roles and embracing them. Right. We're going to get there in a moment. But. I needed to throw that out there really quickly so you guys understand. Yes, it's a give and take. Yes, it's a level of compromise. But at the same time, sisters. We have to remember that there is um, a place that we need to stay in because a lot of sisters forget that. I hear, I've heard this a number of times like, well, my husband did boom, boom, boom. But if I did that, then I, I would be wrong. Well, yes, you would be flat out wrong. What your husband did was probably not wise, but it wasn't wrong. If you do it, you will absolutely be wrong in the scriptures. And I need you guys to understand this. This isn't me being a chauvinist or a misogynist or a, a, um, what, whatever other word you have for, you know, woman hater or, or oppressor, all that. No, this is what the book says. There is actually, um, what's that word? Double standards. There are double standards in the Bible. I done heard things like, um, you know, my, my, my husband was, you know, flirting with some sisters on social media and, you know, he doesn't understand how that's wrong. Well, it's not wrong, but it's not wise either. But if I would have done it, then I'd be wrong. You'd absolutely be wrong because you're enticing a man to want to lay with a woman who's married. That's called adultery. If he does it, as long as she's not married and, and they end up doing whatever they do, he now needs to embrace her as his own that's now now you have what's called a sister wife so it's 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 definitely double standards and we have to understand that and we have to accept that there are double standards here and that's not just because i'm saying so it's because that's what the book says that's what the scriptures say right so these are the things that we have to understand so Again, happy house, excuse me, happy spouse, happy house. We've gotten how the Lord views marriages and unions. We've gotten even, you know, to the point of what determines when you're actually in a marriage or a union, right? So now we're going to jump into how to develop a healthy relationship, healthy relationship requirements, right? Let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter six. Um, whoever can get that and whoever does whoever doesn't have that grab me Sirach 37 and 27 what do you want out of chapter 6 and, and 6 and 7 Come. this is the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 6 and verse 7 
and thou wouldest get a friend, prove him first. So hold that, hold that, hold that right there. How do you develop a healthy relationship? First and foremost, before you get into that actual relationship or marriage, you guys need to prove one another. You guys need to know what you're willing to endure, what you're not willing to endure. You need to be able to understand. Um, you Excuse me. You guys need to be able to sit down and have these conversations on, I don't know, child raising. Um, do you whoop kids? Well, no, I don't whoop kids. Well, I do. Well, I just feel like that's abusive. You guys might not see eye to eye on that. Um, financial uh, what is it called? Financial decisions. You need to see what they prioritize. Um, how how do they react when they're upset? You need to see that. Can you endure their ugly? Yes or no. If you can't, mm, that's probably not a relationship you need to get into, right? So there's a number of things that you need to prove. 30 days, 60 days is probably not going to be long enough because everybody says that even in the world, they said somebody can... You can play the role for probably up to a year. A person can fool you for at least a year. You may be able to, you may see glimpses of it, but you'll be blinded by, you know, the butterflies and all of that stuff. So you probably won't see it, right? But people can play that part for a very long time. Again, a number of people, number of people, I've heard this. When we first got together, they weren't like this. And now, you know, they lie and they, they hide things and, and, you know, I found out he, he has a woman problem and and I didn't I didn't think that this was, you know, him like this is a completely different person. Well, you only know him for two months. You didn't prove them. You didn't you didn't have enough time to get to know who they really were. You didn't get to see the skeletons in their closet. You didn't get to see their ugly side and, and determine whether or not you can deal with that. You didn't you didn't have enough time for that. Right. So prove a friend. Read on. Start read that from the top. This is the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 6 and verse 7. If thou wouldest get a friend, prove him first, mm -hmm. and be not hasty to credit him. Don't be fast to just say, oh, no, I know this is the man. This is the man of God. Oh, no, this sister right here, she Proverbs 31, easy, and Ecclesiastes 26. Like, I look, bro, every time I see her, she reading her Bible, and she, she in every clubhouse room, bro. That don't mean a damn thing. Prove her first is what the scriptures tell you. Prove him first. Prove them first. Give me Sirach 37 and 27. Watch this. Uh, this is the book of Sirach, chapter 37 and verse 27. My son, prove thy soul in thy life mm -hmm. and see what is evil for it mm -hmm. and give not that unto it. So now... You prove them, but you prove yourself too. Because you'll find out a lot of, there was a room that was had uh, just a couple of days ago. It was talking about um, women, what do you expect from a man and vice versa, right? Or expecting a husband and vice versa. And there was a sister up there that made a very great point. Um, you have these things called, um, I, I guess you can call them unexpected expectations, right? You didn't even know that you had these expectations, but the moment the situation arises, you realize that you have that expectation. Like I've been so accustomed to, I don't know, my father taking out the trash all my life um, or no, I, I've been so accustomed to my, you know, my father telling me, well, you know, make sure you know how to change a tire, blah, blah, blah. But your man should be doing this. And every time we have an issue like that, my father fixes it. And then all of a sudden I end up with the man and everything's going good. We catch a flat on the side of the road and he don't know how to change a tire. And now I'm looking at him some type of way because you had unexpected expectations. That was something you didn't know was going to bother you, but it ended up bothering you. So you need to prove yourself. What can I deal with? What can't I deal with? What do I really expect? What don't I expect? What can I handle? What can I not handle? What am I willing to put up with? What can I not put up with? So this is even before we get into the happy spouse part, right? This is all prereqs. Prereqs. You need to prove them. You need to prove you before you can, but before anything. Because if, if you end up in a situation where you guys, um, 
where you thought you knew them or where you thought these things were, you know, what it ends up not being, well, you're going to be in a world of uh, a world of headache. And it's going to be a lot of it's going to be a, it's going to be an uphill battle from that point on. So prove them first. Prove them first. See how they react. See what you can endure. See what they can endure. Right now, go to Hebrews 13 and verse 16. Again, we're here in healthy relationship requirements. Mm. Proving, proving first and foremost yourself and them. What you can deal with, what they can deal with. What your ugly is, what their ugly is. What what will set you off, what will trigger you, what will trigger them, right? Understanding all of that, the proving is first and foremost. Give me um, Hebrews 13 and 16. It's the book of Hebrews, chapter 13 and verse 16. But to do good and to communicate, uh-huh. forget not. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Right. So we see here, because this is where, be completely honest, be frank, uh, most people screw up right here to do good and communicate. People don't know how to talk to each other. I done, I done been and personally done been in a relationship where individual gets mad. My, my ex would get mad and fly off the handles. Every, everything that I've done for them thus far the whole good, what is it called? Um, the good streak we've been on. It's been peaceful. It's been beautiful. Goes out the window. Goes out the window once they get an attitude. Goes out the window when they can't communicate to me what it is that they feel is bothering them. And I'm like, yo, you're just tripping right now. Now you a, you a whole nigga. You ain't shit. You all all of that good stuff. Because people don't know how to communicate properly when things are bothering them. Or we have the people who like to shut down, which creates big problems as well, because now you're shutting down. And what's going to happen is, oh, we can never talk because you don't understand and so on and so forth. But the truth of the matter is, no, you just don't know how to communicate. And you Every time we try to have these conversations, you want to shut down. Every time we have these conversations, you don't want to have these conversations. You keep it bottled up. But there's then that one day where it all comes pouring out and you blow up on somebody, right? So we have to learn to communicate together. We have to learn to say, brothers have to learn to humble down. I had to learn this. I didn't learn this until probably like a year ago. You have to learn to say, sweetheart, this is what's bothering me. Here is why. This is what I don't like that you're doing. Here is why. Not, I'm going to keep, I'm going to hold it in. I'm going to hold it in. I'm acting like it's not bothering me. And the moment we get into an argument, I'm going to throw all that in her face. You can't do that. It says do good and communicate. Not just communicate because communicate. We're not talking, communication is of course just the, the ability to, uh, what is the word? Uh, be able to send messages back and forth to one another. That's what communicating is. But we're talking about effective communication, righteous communication. Because technically speaking, if you're like, man, you always on some bullshit. You, you see, you wicked as hell. That's you're communicating. But that's not effective, righteous communication. So when it's what it's telling you is to do good and communicate. You can't forget that for with such sacrifices. It's a sacrifice to humble down and say, I know I'm livid right now, but I cannot blow up on her because it won't be fruitful. I know I'm pissed off right now, but if I say such and such, then I'm going to be out of order and then I'm going to have to answer to the most high. So I got to check myself right here. It's a sacrifice to do that because you're sacrificing now what you feel. You're sacrificing now what you really really want to do you're even sacrificing your pride in that moment to do what is right to do what the lord is asking you to do and communicate properly right so 
We've covered how the Lord feels about marriages. We've covered what is an actual marriage, an actual union, right? And now we're in what's called healthy relationship requirements, proving one another and proving ourselves, communicating effectively with one another, communicating respectfully to one another, being transparent and open with one another. That's that's just wisdom. I'm not going to sit up because anybody, everybody who likes to play the game will show me in the law, blah, blah, blah. I'm giving you wisdom according to the scriptures. This is this is what will allow you to have a happy house because we see all through the scriptures what a man should be doing and what a woman should be doing. That's ideal. That That is in, in a utopia, perfect world. This is how it's going to go. But we don't live in that perfect world. We live in a world, we live in a place where a lot of our women are influenced by what we call Babylon. And in Babylon, they teach women that it's not liberating to submit to a man. In Babylon, they teach that you aren't the, the, the role of a homemaker raising up the next generation is not a fruitful one. It's actually a, 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 a basic role. And you should be ashamed of yourself if you haven't established a, a career yet for yourself. Right. That's that's what we're that's where we are right now in the world, unfortunately. So we have to be practical. Scriptures teach you how to utilize wisdom. Right. So in an ideal world, the women will follow all of these laws in the scriptures, all of the wisdom given in Ecclesiastes and Proverbs 31. The men will will add here 100 percent perfectly to first timothy five and eight and be that provider in every single realm but we don't live in that world we got some brothers in 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 this walk still affected by babylon too they they still struggle with you know i i like i like lying and and i I be sneaking around and and you know i I do be on the low in in sisters dms i know they're not single i mean i know they're not uh they're not married but you know, I I know I'm not able to take care of them. I know I'm not able to lead and provide for them the way that I'm supposed to. But man, is she bad, right? We have to be practical about a lot of this stuff. And this is why the scriptures are here. Because in a perfect world, we wouldn't even need all the, the wisdom in Sirach and Ecclesiastes and Proverbs because the law is there. And if we're doing the law properly, then we wouldn't need all of this guidance, which the rest of the book has given us. But we don't live in an ideal and perfect world. We live in reality. So we have to be practical now. So this is all about being practical. Yes, there are things that you don't see that are quote unquote in the law, but there's a lot of wisdom given in this book to help you in your relationships and help you to have a happy spouse, which gives you what's called a happy house, right? Now, Let's go to, um, do I want to touch that next? Yeah, let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and touch that. Um, let's go to first Corinthians seven and three. Mm. And whoever, uh, whoever got it, you can just start reading it. Uh, this book of first Corinthians chapter seven and verse three, that the husband render, render unto the wife, do benevolence. Hold that. Hold, 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 hold on. And I need people to understand this, right? Because a lot of brothers talk about it. The Lord don't deal with emotion. Do benevolence is literally emotion. It's affection. It's um ad- admiration. Do benevolence. People try to hold it to oh, that's that's just sex. No, it's not. But to to benevolence is affection and love that you give that you render to someone that's what benevolence is benevolence may be your wife just wants to lay up under you while y'all watching movies if she's on top of her game and doing her stuff you can't be in you you can't sit up there and deny her of that it's due it's due right read um i'm sorry read that from the top and read on Come. First Corinthians seven and three. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. Mm-hmm. Verse four: The wife hath no power over her own body, mm-hmm. but the husband, and likewise also the husband hath no power over his own body, but the wife. Verse five: 
Verse 5. <clears throat> defraud you not one another, Salakia. Defraud you not one the other, except it be in consent for a time, mm -hmm. that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, but Satan tempt you not for your inconsistency. And your incontinency. Salakia, incontinency. Right, so when it's referencing incontinency, it's talking about your lack of self-control or your lack of control for a sexual desire, right? So it's telling you to render that love, affection, that sex to one another because it's due. Now, mind you, brothers can't be treating their wives like second-class citizens and expecting that they're going to get benevolence. That's not due. It's not owed to you. If you're treating them like dogs, it's not owed to you. If you're talking to them like they ain't they ain't ish, it's not owed to you. Women, you can't expect arguing with your husband all damn day, every day of the week, not not complying with what it is that he's expressing that you need to do when the scriptures tell you that your desire should be to him and expecting him to give you any ride. You can't. It's not owed to you. You can't expect for you to give him a headache all the time. And he's doing everything he's supposed to do, but you're not doing what you're supposed to do. But you want, baby, let's go to the movies together. Let's spend some time. Hell no. I don't want to spend time with you because it's not owed to you because you have not earned it. Now, some people say, what? You have to earn it. What is the, what, what, what do you mean? This is a, a um, what what the hell is that word? Um, I can't, I can't think of it right now. But a lot of people feel that way. It's like, what, we're married. What do you mean I have to earn it? Yeah. You can't be an asshole all the time. You can't be disrespectful all the time. You can't not listen to your husband all the time and then expect for him to give you love. He feels resentment towards you, and rightly so. And you have to understand that. Scriptures say, you, you shall be rendered or given due benevolence, owed benevolence. How are you owed it? By holding up your end of the bargain as a spouse. The woman being that pillar of rest, the woman being uh, having her desire being toward her husband, the woman submitting wholeheartedly to her husband as unto the Lord, as the scriptures say, will give you that do benevolence. And what's so crazy is I've said this before. If, if women just did these things, men will give you the world. If you read the book of Ezra, mm -hmm. is it for, I think it's first Ezra when they talk about what is strongest. It says the woman and he broke it down to a T. He said the woman, everybody's scared of the king. The, the king got the power to, to wave a finger and, and, and have you be put to death. People wouldn't dare challenge the king, but the woman that he's with will take the crown off of his head and put it on her head. The woman that 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 he's with can talk to him how, however. He, he falls head over heels. He, it says men have lost their wits over a woman. Men will conquer the world for a woman, right? So men will give you everything if you just do something as simple as be his peace be his rest stop going back and forth stop fighting just comply submit to me like you would unto the lord and, and i'm going to reciprocate that exponentially to the to the umph degree guaranteed right and then you can get that due affection love benevolence that you want right um I wanted I to give you the definition of benevolence real quick. If I could. Go ahead, read that. Read that up. So benevolence, right? It says an inclination to do kind or charitable acts. Mm -hmm. An act intending or showing kindness and goodwill. Right? So that's the, defin the yeah. definition of the word benevolence. Kind. So and when we're, and when we're putting it... Go ahead, I no, I'm just saying it's more than just sex. It's what you were saying. God, absolutely. And and when you put it in, of course, marriage terms, the kind things that you know that will make your spouse happy, right? So she might be 
more touchy feely. I just want to lay up under you. I just, I just, I just want you to sit next to me, even if we ain't talking to each other. Just, I just want to sit by you. I just want your presence. <coughs> Salakia, it may be she might just want to to have conversation with you. It can be a number of things. It's not just sex, but these things have to be owed. These things have to be due, and it can't be due if you're treating each other like <clears throat> with with what is it called with no regard, right? Ben, do me a favor. <clears throat> Let's go to First Corinthians eleven and three. I was going to touch on two other things, but I don't think I need to. Um, so we have to render do benevolence again these are healthy relationship requirements you have to show love and affection toward one another sisters you got to give it up i done heard listen i done heard many of brothers having problems because like man i'll be in the mood i'll be trying to get some and my wife always talking about she's not in the mood or she's too tired like and this is like a every damn near everyday thing and these are brothers that i know these are brothers whose wives I know. These are brothers who, I, you know, I'm there in their house. We, we're, we're comfortable enough to let our hair down around each other. So I know they're dynamic in their house. So I know this brother is not, or these brothers are not like monsters to their wives. And the, their wives will attest to that. They aren't a-holes. They aren't monsters. They, for the most part, are laid back. They let a lot of things slide. Through. They don't make big deals out of things. So you talk about, oh, I'm tired. Oh, I don't feel like it all the time. Listen. Verse um, five, defraud ye not one another. I'm going to drop down to the bottom that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. You cannot defraud your husband. Oh, I'm tired. You can't pull that every night. You can't do that. You cannot do that because then what's going to happen is the brothers are going to be like, you know what? I'm tired of this. I'm a man. I know this is one thing that I absolutely need for myself. And she doesn't want to give it to me. I'm going to go find another wife. See, you just want some sex. And da -da -da -da. No, no, no. That is one thing that I do want that you're not giving me. But no, that's not the only reason why. But I know if I find another woman, she will appreciate me more. And she will at least render me due benevolence as well. You're not giving me that. And it's not a lust thing. It's a, as a man, this is still something that we need. This is something that we want, right? And now, of course, the scriptures tell you, don't take a don't, take not a woman for lust, just after lust. But that's going to always play a role because we're married. We're going to do married people things. Married, the, the married people things is we're going to lay down with each other. We're going to do what we do. But if you're defrauding me of that, well, guess what? Somebody, somebody out there wants all of me, not just the benefits that they can get from me. I don't know, financially or me providing whatever the case is. They're going to give me that as well. As the scriptures say, you're going to you're putting each other in a position when you're not giving that to one another, when you're defrauding one another of that. Right. <laughs> Scripture said in Proverbs 5 and 19, let her breast satisfy thee and be thou ravished in her love. That's a part of being married. That's a poetic way of saying y'all can do what y'all do. Y'all, y'all marry. Y'all get as freaky as y'all want to get. If y'all want to swing one of, one of my, one of my beloved, beautiful sisters, if y'all want to swing from the chandeliers, God damn it. Swing from the chandeliers. If, if your husband want to throw on Tarzan trucks and jump off the sink, he can do that. <laughs> Whatever y'all do, y'all do. Y'all need to be ravished with one another's love right so again healthy relationship requirements proving one another proving each other before you guys even enter into that covenant communicating with one another respectfully and effectively love sex affection with one another right these are keys to having a healthy relationship now here's the big one playing your role embracing your role which will give you the affection which will give you the love which will give you the due benevolence which will also even help you to be able to communicate better with one another because if somebody's doing nothing but right by you 
you're going to try your best. I don't want to offend this person. I know I'm irritated. They irritated me this one time, but they're always usually on point. They're always usually solid. So I'm going to make sure that I communicate how I'm feeling right now with them in mind. I'm going to be considerate. If you play your role right, I promise you the previous things are going to fall in place easily. So let's go to 1 Corinthians 11 and 3. This is the book of first Corinthians chapter 11, verse three. Mm -hmm. But I would have, you know, that the head of every man is Christ mm -hmm. and the head of the woman is the man mm -hmm. and the head of Christ is Yahweh. Con, right. So we see here and I know women get tired of hearing this, but that's too damn bad <laughs> because the scriptures say what they say. And this is something that has to keep getting reiterated. <clears throat> Excuse me, because when our sisters get frustrated, when they get upset, when they get angry, when they get in their feelings, they forget this. So we have to keep reiterating this. At the end of the day, there is an order. Not just any order, a divine order. The Lord set this, set this up. He said, that man is your head. That man is above you. That man is to lead you and guide you and you are to be beneath him, not as a doormat, but as a subordinate and listen to what it is that he's telling you and where he's trying to lead you. You have to take heed to what it is that he's giving you. Right. Go to. Um, you know, let's jump to this one real quick. No. Yeah, let's jump to this. one. Let's go to Ephesians five and twenty two. I'm going to work a little backwards right now. Ephesians 5 and verse 22. It's the book of Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 22. And it reads, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands mm -hmm. as unto the Lord. Mm -hmm. For the husband is the head of the wife. Again, you see that? It said it again. The husband is your leader. The husband is your superior. Read. Even as Christ is the head of the church, uh huh, and he is the savior of the body. So you see that, right? The comparison being made. First off, it said, submit yourselves unto your husbands as you will submit yourselves unto the Lord. Then it turns around and says, for your husband is the head of you, even as Christ is the head of the church and the savior of the body. Right. So just like Christ leads the church what does christ do christ gives out commands to the church christ tells the church you can do this you can't do that well you're the church your husband is christ in this situation right so it is his job to direct you it is his job to tell you yay or nay in situations it is his job to protect you it is his job to uh what does it say um Da, 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 da. And he is the savior of the body. It is your, your husband's job to make sure that he is helping you to become what's called saved. He should be leading you in that direction to be saved. Just like Christ does with the church. He gave all of these commandments and all of these orders to the churches he or to the people, to his disciples rather. Because this is what was needed. This is what was mandated at that time. Then he even gave orders to Paul. He said, I need you to go to what people refer to as the Gentiles, the scattered amongst Israel and bring them back. These are orders given out by Christ. It is your husband's job to lead you and tell you these are the things that you need to do. These are the things you can't do. These are the things that you can't do. Because at the end of the day, who's the one protecting you? Who's the one looking out for you? It's supposed to be that man. So some of y'all be feeling a way about it, but. If you're feeling a way about it, you have to take that up with the most high because the Lord is the one that set this up for you. Right. Well, what if my husband is is, um, you know, the, he's overbearing. He's a lion in this house and da, 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 da. Well, that goes back. Let's move back to the top. Prove a friend. Prove your own souls. Take the time to get to know one another what you can and cannot deal with. If you do that, 
then you won't even have to worry about these things because you know where it is he stands in certain situations. You know where it is that he, what it is he will allow and what it is he won't allow. You'll know these things if you prove them and prove yourself what you can and can't deal with, what they can and can't deal with, what they will and will not allow, right? You won't have these problems, but if you jump the gun, well, what do you expect? You didn't follow what it is the Lord set in place in wisdom, because again, there's no law on it, but the Lord placed men with wisdom to give you this wisdom that you did not adhere to. So now if you get stuck in a situation because you didn't adhere to the wisdom of the Lord, you're stuck in that situation and you need to, you guys need to figure it out at that point. Right? So it is your husband's job to direct you, to, to command you for lack of better words, to instruct you. Give me Sirach 26 and 14. Again, we're talking about the roles of our beloved women right now. Read that. This is the book of Sirach, chapter 26 and verse 14. A silent and loving woman mm -hmm. is a gift of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And there is nothing so much worth as a mind well instructed. So your role, your role, and, and I want to any brother who is a teacher, any brother with wisdom understands this scripture isn't telling women to just sit down and shut up. That's not what it's saying. It says a silent and loving woman is a gift of the Lord. Now watch this. It continues on. And there is nothing much worth as a mind well instructed. This is literally telling you a, a woman who is teachable, a woman who is coachable is a blessing. Be that teachable, be that humble, be that coachable, virtuous woman, right? Don't be sitting up every time your husband says something to you, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta shoot back. Don't be that individual that if something doesn't go your way or you don't like something, I, well, I just gotta voice my opinion. No, you don't. No, you don't. Because then you're gonna build up resentment because your husband is like, yo, like, you just have no respect, you don't have any respect for me. So I don't want to deal with you. You don't want that situation. You really don't. You don't want situations like that. Be coachable. Be humble. Be teachable. Be silent. You don't have to argue all the time. You don't always have to voice your opinion. You, you really don't. Me and my wife have had that conversation a couple of times. And that was one of the things when, when we were getting to know each other. She told me, she said, I know this is one thing that's not good, but I'm working on it. I, I tend to have to voice my opinion on things that I should probably be quiet on. Right. And I don't, I, I would say that I, I haven't really had those issues with her. She's done it like once or twice, but she's real quick when I'm like, sweetheart, you're doing it again. Or you, you just, you just always finding different things to complain about. Here you go again. So check herself right there because she's coachable because she's teachable which allows me to be able to communicate with her effectively because i'm considerate because nine times out of ten she's on point which allows me to want to give her more due benevolence more love more affection more hey sweetheart what do you want to go do because she's on point and she's that mind well instructed and she's silent and loving right these things help sisters one of your roles is to be coachable, be teachable, so you know what the desire of your husband is, so that you can have your desire toward him. So you can humble down and be able to submit fully toward him or to him. You have to be, you have to be, listen to me when I say, you have to be coachable. You have to be able to not always have something to say. And we live in this world today where women feel, well, well, so you're telling me I can't say nothing. I just feel like that that's not fair. You guys are muzzling us. No, it's because it's not fruitful all the time. Say something when it's going to be fruitful, not because you feel in a type of way. Because then you're just going to create problems in the house because you just had to say this, had to have the last word. You just couldn't shut up 
to make sure that we don't have this big blow up because you just had you just just had to get this off your chest. That's not wise. You're not being a wise woman. And then a lot of times when we end up in those situations, it's not like you communicated it effectively. It's not like you did what it says in Proverbs 31. The matter of fact, I'm going to go grab that really quickly. It's not like you did um, Proverbs chapter 31 and verse 26. It's not like it says she openeth her mouth with wisdom. And then her tongue is the law of kindness. It's not like you opened it in a fashion that, you know, you were you were speaking in a respectful and productive way. Most women think because they speak soft. Oh, no, that's respectful. Right. No. What happens is you'll be passive aggressive, but you'll say it in a tone like this. Like I've literally heard sisters and I know I'm going to have to bleep this out when I upload it to YouTube, whatever. I've literally heard sisters say, yeah, you know, I've had conversations with my husband and, you know, we've been in situations where, you know, with this same right here, this exact same tone and this exact same way. I'll be like, fuck you. Just because you speak soft don't mean you're respectful. Just because you speak soft don't mean <laughs> don't mean that you're being that virtuous spirited woman. Right. That's it. Y'all got to understand that. So sisters, be coachable. Sisters, be understanding. Sisters, be silent. Stop always having something to say. Stop always voicing your opinion. Opinion versus what is right or wrong is two different things. Opinion, when something may have not been the wisest, but it wasn't really a bad decision, but you just felt like it should have been done this way, you're, go you're breeding more problems. Just be quiet. Be coachable. Do me a favor. Um, I think, Azriel, did you read 14 or was that Ben? Uh, I read 14. Okay, drop down to 16. Con. Here we go with the, another part of your role. Read. Con. As the sun, when it ariseth in the, in the high heaven, so is the beauty of a good wife. In the ordering of her house. Right. It says, as the sun when it ariseth in the high heaven. What does that mean? When you see the sun at 12 o'clock noon, it's at what? It's brightest. It's peak. It's most glorious time. Because that's when everything shines the brightest. Right? It says, just like when you see that, that's how beautiful or how, how radiant the beauty of a woman uh, uh, radiates when they keep their house in order sisters keep your house in order make sure everything is clean make sure it's spick and span make sure the kids is taken care of make sure the kids are in order make sure you're teaching them babies the law statutes and commandments of course are the most high but teaching them uh, uh um what the heck is that word um i can't believe i'm drawing a blank right now um etiquette you're teaching the kids etiquette. You're teaching the kids manners. You're teaching the kids how to be wise. You're teaching them how to critically think. You're, you're, you're teaching them morals and scruples. Make sure the house is in order. It said there is nothing sexier than a woman who is doing all of that. Listen to me when I say, sisters, when y'all keep things in order and your husband can come home or your husband can look at you and say, man, she really got her ish together, man. It literally elevates you a, a couple of levels up like you can you can be mm, okay looking decent looking but your husband of course he loves you because you have whatever other qualities and he knows like i know my wife ain't the baddest but i i love her because of boom 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 when you keep everything together when you when you got your house in order when when your husband can look at you and say man she how did the lord bless me with this that is the biggest turn on to brothers. You don't understand. When your shit is right, that is the biggest turn on to brothers. It says there is nothing more beautiful than a woman who orders her house. Oh, excuse me. Than a woman in the ordering of her house. Sisters, that's one of your big roles. Keep the house in order. One of your other big roles, making sure that you're coachable, making sure that you're teachable. One of your other roles, submitting to your husband wholeheartedly. You would never submit to the Lord half-assed. If the Lord said, 
go take out the trash. You're not going to say, well, I got to do it. That's a man's job. You're going to go do it because the Lord said it. It said you need to submit to your husband that way. If you about to go out and the Lord says, no, you need to sit at home and read. You're not going to say, why, God? So if your husband says, nah, babe, tonight is not the night to go out. We, we, we stand at the house. We feed in our spirit, whatever the case is. It should be no talk back. It should be no, no, no going back and forth about that because it says submit yourself to your husband as you would the Lord. It's that simple. It really is that simple. That's li in a nutshell. That is your role. Order the house. Keep the house in order. Be coachable. Be teachable. Be humble. Be submissive. Embracing your role. And if you do that, you'll get the due benevolence from your husband. You'll get the effective and loving and considerate communication from your husband. But you got to just listen to me, sisters. You got to adhere to what I'm saying. Be coachable. Be silent. Be, be, be able to be instructed. So I can so I can feed into you this wisdom that you need to be that reflection of me that I want you to be. Now for the men. Let's talk about the men. I know sisters was waiting for this. Let's talk about the men. Let's go to First Timothy. Let's go to First Timothy five and eight. Whoever got it, you can read it. Uh, what do you need out of First Timothy? First Timothy chapter five and verse eight. Oh, ben, you got it. And I got it. This book of okay, come. Okay, it's like it. this is the book of First Timothy. The like that. I was real. Grab me. Um. First Peter three and seven, and grab me Ephesians five, and just hold it. I'll give you the verse in a minute. Go ahead, Ben. Come. This is the book of 1 Timothy, chapter 5 and verse 8. But if any provide not for his own house, it's like it, for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith mm -hmm. and, and is worse than an infidel. So the scripture says if a man is not providing for his house, he is worse than an unbeliever. And we know an unbeliever has no place in the kingdom of God. So you know what that's saying? A man who ain't on top of his stuff as a husband is he's in danger of not getting the kingdom. This is the importance. I, I, I read a meme the other day. Every men and I it goes both ways because women do this, too. It says men want a what men want to be married because they want a wife not because they want to be a husband a lot of people don't understand what was just said people are saying well by default of course he wants to be a husband no he wants to be a husband in title not in deed it's not the same thing you want a wife to give you these wifely duties and so on and so forth but you're not ready to take on the role of a husband and read that again for me ben and we we finna break this down huh but if any Provide not for his own and actually for those of his own house. He hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. So when we're talking about being a husband, we're talking about the provider, the provider. What do I mean by that? People are like, yeah, he got to have a good job. Nope. Not even what the hell I'm talking about. Granted, financially, the brother should be providing. We talking further than that. We talking further than that today. If this man is not a provider spiritually, is this man guiding you? What have you learned from him? How are you how are you getting your spirit fed? Are you just other watching other people's videos? Is he giving you these understandings? Is he helping you to become a virtuous woman? Is he telling you what it is that you should be doing as far as your role is concerned? Is he providing for you spiritually in these scriptures, giving you the understanding of the law, giving you the understanding of wisdom, how you should be conducting yourself every day? What is proper etiquette? What is what is wise in the eyes of the Lord? Even though it may not be law, if you walk this way, the Lord looks highly on that. Is he teaching you these things spiritually? Is he providing for you spiritually? Is he providing for you emotionally? Is he giving you emotional stability, emotional security? Now, mind you, sisters, don't get the game twisted. He's not. 
going to coddle you and he's not going to kiss your ass. You're not getting that. But if this man is giving you the security that you need and you're just being a brat about it and you need more because everything needs to be about you, 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 that's too damn bad. That's not happening. That's not going to happen. That's not how the game goes. But if the man is not giving this to you, if he's not showing you that 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 love and respect that you should be getting, he's not providing. He's not providing for you emotionally. Is he so so is he providing emotionally? Is he providing spiritually? Can he protect you? Is he providing protection from you for you? Excuse me. Is he providing protection for you? Right? Can he do these things? Is he is he providing um mental stimulation is what I'll call it? Is he helping you to grow as a person? Is he doing these things? If he's not providing for you, that is not a husband. Brothers, if you have a wife, I don't give a I don't care how upset you are at them. I don't care if you guys are in a not so great space. It is your job to help build them up. Sisters, it is. I don't care if you guys are in a bad space. It is your job to listen and take heed to what he's saying and what he's teaching you. Unless it's wrong, of course. If it's wrong, different story. Completely different ball game. But if he's teaching you according to these scriptures and he's communicating these things right, get out your damn feelings. Humble down to listen to that man. Brothers, I don't care if she's upsetting you, irritating your soul, whatever the case is. It's your job. Listen to me. Listen to me good. You are worse than an infidel. If you sit your woman to the side and she has not committed fornication on you, you are worse than an infidel. If because she gets on your nerves and I'm just tired of dealing with this and yada, 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 you're worse than an infidel. What the hell are you in the truth for then? I'm going to just put it out there like that. I, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't smoke weed. I don't, I don't fornicate. I don't, I don't, I keep the Sabbath days when I can, whatever, whatever the case is, but you are not providing spiritually, emotionally for your spouse. You're doing all of this for nothing. All of it. I know I'm an Israelite. I wear my fringes. Who cares? You're going to be a fringe wearing nigga in the lake. So what? Because you didn't provide for your household. That is unrighteous. That is, that is, that is, uh, what's the word? Dishonorable. Brothers, if anybody has a has a question, hold it until the end. So, but you have to understand if that woman didn't commit fornication, I don't care how much of a headache she is. It's your job to try and get through to her. If she ups and leaves, well, if the unbelieving depart, let them depart. That's what the scriptures say. But until then, it's your job to keep trying because one of two things will happen. They'll eventually get it or they'll eventually leave. But what you're not going to do, not un here's the thing. It's not us that you should be afraid of. Me, Dominique, Corey, Tazaria, Ariala, Ben. It's not the brothers in, in, in our phases. It's not us. It's the Lord that you should be scared of. Because if you're doing this shit, the Lord is going to judge you. Paul is speaking as a man ordained by Christ. So we know that this man is what you would call quote unquote anointed. He was anointed by Christ, by the anointed. He said, I need you to go out and do this work. He was a man who wholeheartedly tried his best to be as sincere as he can to do his job. So if this man said that, I'm pretty sure he didn't just pull this out of his ass. He's telling you, look, if you're not providing, which when we read the scriptures, Exodus 22 and 16, it says, you shall surely endow her to be your wife. Well, by default, if you make her your wife, you're you're in you must be a husband to her. And if you're not providing husbandly duties and husbandly roles, you're you're technically a, you're you're in sin. Because there are un, there are unspoken rules to how things should go in a marriage. And you're not going to see word for word these things in the in, in the law because marriages are circumstantial. We understand this, but we know one one thing everybody, everybody in the scriptures know. One thing everybody here knows, 
is an is an individual who marries someone and sits her to the side and no longer takes care of her. That's not a you're not a husband. And if you do that, you're wicked. You're worse than an infidel. So if you're feeling some type of way, any 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 brother, because I've on a number of occasions, I didn't I didn't, man, bro. I'm just I'm I'm just tired. I'm I'm finna just be done talking to him. I didn't hurt this. Seven years in the truth. I probably heard this about 10 times now. 10, 15-ish times, right? And I'm like, you cannot do that. As a matter of fact, put myself on front street. I was one of them niggas that said that. This was 2017, bro. I'm like, yo, just ain't no getting through to her. And, and my bishop, over and over, that's what you married, huh? That's what you married, so you need to make it work. And when I say I tried, I I tried everything that this man said. And one of two things happened. Either they get it, they appreciate it, they get right, or they leave. Mine left. All praises. Because now I watch how the Lord is judging her and life life ain't so sweet on the other side in the world where you thought it would be beautiful. Right? And the Lord, all praise to the Most High, has blessed me with my wife that I have now. Almost, I mean, you know, no marriage is perfect, but almost no problems. A mind that's well instructed for the most part. Um, always, always striving to make sure that she's keeping the ordering of the house. Always doing her best to to submit to to whatever my will is. All praises to the Most High for that, right? So one of two things is going to happen if you, you know, if you're in a situation where you don't. I, I just, I just feel like she's not going to get it. Well, it's still your job to provide, and we'll see if she gets it or not. If she leaves, she leaves. If she doesn't you see that it was worth it. But if you don't provide spiritually, emotionally, if you don't provide that protection for her, if you don't provide that security and stability for her, you're worse than an infidel. Brothers. Brothers. That's wicked. So y'all, brothers need to listen, 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 listen. Get that together don't be worse than an infidel don't do that because you're literally you're in this walk for what you're, you're sitting in these rooms for what you're, you're sitting in the q a for what you're wearing fringes for what you're gonna do all of that and still not make it because you wasn't a provider for the woman that you were supposed to provide for that you laid down with that you chose what did i ask first peter three and seven was the next one right Oh uh, yeah, or was come, it? Or was come, it Ephesians? Come, come Ephesians was after that. Three and seven, and then you wanted some of the Ephesians five. Okay, that, hold, hold Ephesians five. Peter Go ahead, read. read. Go ahead and read First Peter. Um, uh, this is the book of First Peter, chapter three and verse seven. Likewise, come. ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge. Hold on, slow this down, right? So we, no, matter of fact, finish it. Finish it. Likewise, ye husbands. Dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife, as unto the weaker vessel. So like you're giving what? Giving honor unto the wife. Giving honor to your wife, right? As unto the weaker vessel. Right. So what happens is people read the scripture and we erase. It's like when when uh when we, I'm pretty sure y'all brothers and sisters have seen the meme. It says how Christians read the Bible. Judge not, and then everything else is scribbled out. A lot of brothers do this with this scripture. Are you the weaker vessel? Okay, scripture say to honor them. So now what? Why, why, why do we skip all of that and just say you're the weaker vessel? Scriptures don't say they are a weak vessel. It says they are the weaker vessel. There's a difference. Big difference. The men are supposed to be the strongest, the most upright, the most on point. And then you have the women who are not as strong spiritually who are not as strong I'm not does whatever who are not as strong um mentally who are not even as strong in the scripture scripturally right but that doesn't mean they're weak that just means they're weaker than you and it says you're supposed to honor them and deal with them according to what knowledge not according to how you feeling and because you upset and, and your emotions no it says deal with them according to excuse me, according to knowledge. And that's what a lot of people miss. Your wife might be, you know, she might be on one that day. 
you don't get you don't get to because remember we talked about toxic quote unquote masculinity. You don't get to meet that fire with fire. You being the more logical individual, this is scientifically proven, not just, you know, biblically speaking, not just me being, oh, you're just a man. That's why you're saying that. No, scientifically speaking, women are a lot more emotional than men. You guys process things different. We're wired differently. So the man knowing that he's supposed to be the more logical, more reasonable, more uh, analytical, less emotional. If she popping off, we'll, we'll, we'll get, get mad, maybe even raising her voice, maybe deciding today I'm going to rebel. Whatever the case is, deal with her according to knowledge. There's a wise way to communicate this information to her. There's a wise way to even deal with that situation. Deal with her according to knowledge. Honor her as the weaker vessel, not just sit up there and call out, oh, you're the weaker vessel. Oh, that see, scripture, that's what the scripture say, you know, wickedness come from the woman. Y'all wicked as hell. Stop that dumb shit. Stop doing that. Because you know what that's going to do? That's going to set her off in defense mode. And then you guys are going to be arguing now because you dealt with that like an idiot. Deal with her according to knowledge. Babe, you, you tripping today, babe. I don't know what's going on. Do, you, do we need to sit down and have a conversation? What's up? You, you do. Are you feeling the way toward me? Is did you have a bad day? What's up? Talk to me. Okay. Well, let's let's sit down and actually let's let's handle it. Because right now you're just not in character. You're, you're not. You're not. You're not being that woman that I know you can be. You're not being that Proverbs thirty one one woman that you've been every other day. You're not being that 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 uh woman who is silent and loving today. I don't. I don't know what's going on. What's talk to me. Not, man, see, there you, the, the Lord ain't dealing with emotion, so you better stop that shit. Man, look, that, that's what I'm talking about. You you and your opinions and you and your feelings instead of, you know, talk, what, what the scriptures say. Stop doing, stop. Dude, that's not wise. Stop being stupid. I'm going to call it like it is. Stop being stupid. Yes, we know there are things that are not in the law, but there are things that are wise. So stop that whole, well, it's the, that's, that's, what, what does the law say? Well, I didn't, I didn't do nothing wrong, so what you tripping for? Stop that. Stop that. Be considerate. Provide that emotional security, emotional stability for them. Provide that love for them. Else you deny the faith. Else you're worse than an infidel. Now, if you're fine with that, that's that's on you. It's between you and the most high. Ben, give me Ephesians 5. And um, we'll read 25, and we're going to drop down to 28. Uh, and we're going to read 28 through 29. Uh, Talaki, am I, am I breaking up? Can y'all hear me clearly? No, nah, you good, King. Okay, I'll <clears> break this. <throat> this is the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, and verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church God. and and gave himself for it. Okay. Oh, well, you know what? We're gonna hold no, drop down to 28. We're gonna read this whole thing. Then we're gonna then we're gonna come back to it and we're gonna pick it apart. Go ahead. Read 28 and 29. Con. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and, ch and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. Right. And so we got to talk about it. A lot of brothers read 22 and 23. He's supposed to submit to me like you submit to the Lord. A lot of people like to sweep under the rug. Um you know, 25, 28, and 29. It says, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. He, he That's literally what he did. He was willing to die for the church. Brothers, y'all willing to die for y'all wives? Brothers, do y'all love your wives so much? Do you love them as much as you love yourself? If you don't want to be talked to a certain way, why talk to her a certain way? If you don't like being ignored, why are you going to ignore her? Because you're upset. Love her as you love yourself. Things that you wouldn't appreciate, things that you don't like. Why would you do that? Why are you doing that? 
I don't, I don't like people being inconsiderate. Well, why are you being inconsiderate toward her? Don't be a hypocrite. Don't do that. It says love, verse 28, so ought men to love their wives with their own body. He that loveth his, loveth his wife loveth himself. So if you don't love your wife and you aren't treating her according to knowledge and you aren't being long suffering with her and you aren't uh, 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 providing for her emotionally and spiritually and so on. Guess what? Guess what? You don't love your damn self. And you got to take that. You're going to have to take that. And the Lord is going to deal with you. And you're putting yourself in danger. I'm not making it because you're worse than an infidel because you're not providing these things, providing that love, that love as much as you love yourself. Verse 29, for no man ever hated his own flesh, but nourisheth it and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. You're supposed to love your wives as you love yourself. Your wife is actually you. That's what the scriptures say. You are one flesh. Of course, you're not the same person, but you guys are supposed to be on one accord and in the eyes of the lord you guys reflect one another you are literally a reflection of her she is a reflection of you she is supposed to be your better half you're supposed to be her better half but for some reason in israel we struggle with this we're struggling 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 because brothers and sisters don't want to adhere to what the lord is saying to what the scriptures have laid out the perfect blueprint to a perfect marriage is right here. But don't nobody want to apply the wisdom of the book because we have so much pride permeating through Israel. Brothers are being taught by leaders. Like I said in the toxic masculinity class, brothers are being taught by leaders that your wife is supposed to submit. If she's not submitting, she's wicked. OK, that's cool. That's cool. That's tr And it's true. But how do they get them to submit? Show her in the scriptures. That's not practical. It's not. It's especially when they're in their feelings. It's, it's not. You, you can't, when they acting out and, and showing their butt and, and got an attitude, you can't go to the scriptures talk about, see, that's why the scriptures say through, through women came the fall of man. The scriptures say ain't no wickedness to, uh, uh, can be compared to the wickedness of a woman. That's, that's called adding fuel to the fire. It's stupid. Stop teaching brothers that. Instead, teach brothers how to be long-suffering. Teach brothers how to have perspective. Teach brothers to have patience with their wives. Teach brothers to be a uh, 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 understanding of their wives. Yes, their wives have opinions. And sometimes the opinions are such a pain in the butt. So annoying. But sometimes they're, they're, they're valid. Teach men to stop saying the Lord ain't dealing with opinions. Kind of, sort of, but not really. Because the scriptures also talk about when you when you've offended someone or you vexed someone and again this is their opinion if they felt like they've been offended and they're already going through something and it's because you were just being an a-hole scriptures say because if they pray to me and they and they pray i, I don't remember it says if they pray to curse you or, or whatever it, whatever it is that they say it says the lord's going to judge you they're, the lord is going to hear their prayers so if it's a prayer to judge you the lord's going to hear that because you were an a-hole to them i believe that's in the book of ecclesiasticus so, yeah, the Lord kind of is dealing with opinions to a degree. Not everyone's opinions. So the scriptures say people are deceived by their own vain opinions because people have been deceived by their own vain opinions. I think Jesus really did die for all of us to, to sin so we can still continue to sin and make it. That's, that's, some, that's your own vain opinion. You made that up in your head and the book doesn't say that. But there are situations if an individual feels some type of way that you've offended them because maybe you could have been more considerate. Maybe you could have been more loving in how you dealt with it and you've upset them. And you end up in a situation where some, you know, somebody prays, Lord, help how, however it is you see fit, help him to see what he did was wrong. And the Lord judges you and puts that on you. That's your fault. The Lord does deal with the pains to a degree. We have to have to get it right in these houses. I done seen so many failed marriages in the truth. I'm like, well, damn, y'all ain't much more different than the people in the world. It's really not. 
And that's why, again, happy spouse, happy house. Brothers, love your wives as your, as your own selves. Brothers, be patient and long-suffering with them. Provide for them emotionally. Provide for them spiritually. Provide for them, uh, provide for them love and affection. Even when you're upset, deal with them according to knowledge. Do right by them. Be considerate. Sisters, be coachable, be teachable, be humble. Stop going back and forth with your husband. Let that man lead you like he's supposed to. If you feel in a type of way, communicate it effectively. Brother, same thing. Communicate these things effectively. Have respectful conversations, even when you guys are in disagreement, and try to see eye to eye. Sisters, if your husband can't seem to see eye to eye, if it's not a, a, a salvation thing, his word at the end of the day is the last, is the final word. Suck it up. Suck it up. You have to. Because marriages is falling apart. People falling out the truth. People on their third husband, which makes them an adulteress, because y'all can't get this right. Because y'all don't want to abide in what the scriptures are telling you to do to have a successful marriage. Get it right. And the last one, give me Matthew 19. 19, uh, 7 through 9, please, Ben. Because this is the book of Matthew, chapter 19 and verse 7. Say unto him, why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorce, divorcement and to put her away? He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her, which is put away, doeth commit adultery. So, I'm gonna tell you this now. I'm gonna tell because I didn't heard this a number of times, and I and I and I and I really feel bad, right, brothers? If if y'all if y'all doing this, if, if y'all writing bill of divorcements and your woman ain't slept with nobody else, your woman ain't lay with another man, she ain't sending no nudes to nobody, she ain't been fondled by nobody, she ain't gave fellatio or reciprocate received it from anybody if she has not fornicated you cannot write her a bill of divorce and if you do you are wicked as hell and you have decided that you are not going to provide for your house and you are worse than an infidel i want you to hear that and i want you to understand that if you have done that to your wife you are worse than an infidel because what you're trying to do is you're trying to get out of taking care of your responsibilities, which makes you wicked as hell. Listen to me again. You're wicked as hell. And you're not much better if you decide that, all right, I'm not going to write her a bill of divorce, but I'm just not going to deal with her because I don't want to deal with her right now. Or I don't want to, you know, I'm, I'm just going to, I'm just going to leave her alone, but I didn't divorce her. I'm just leaving. The same thing, you wicked as hell. That's wrong. And that's not according to me. That's according to the Lord. Y'all got to repent. Any brother that has done that, understand the Lord. Just, just watch what goes on around you. Things are not going to work out for you. Things are going to always fall apart because you decided to do things the wrong way and move in wickedness you cannot divorce your wife for anything other than there is no this ain't no damn california law america's law we had irreconcilable differences look that ain't how i fly around here if y'all got irreconcilable differences y'all asses better figure out how to reconcile it according to the lord unless she laid with somebody else or unless he laid with a married woman because he would have been put to death according to the law but if Nobody is fornicated. Guess what? There's room to fix it. 
and you need to humble yourself and fix it and stop moving because technically speaking, that is you moving in emotion. I'm just tired and I can't deal with it. I'm fed up. No, you can endure more because the Lord has endured so much from your ass. Stop playing. The Lord should have divorced you, should have been put you away. How many Sabbaths you break again? How many times you eat that food that the Lord said you're not supposed to be eating? Oh, how many women did you did you sleep around with before you understood and came into repentance? Oh, the Lord could have been through you away. So, brothers, remember that when you decide you don't want to be long suffering with your wife, how long suffering the Lord is with you. Humble your spirit. Check yourself. So, again, moral of the story, happy spouse, happy house. The things that are needed in a godly union, a healthy relation, the healthy relationship requirements are proving one another before you even lay down and quote unquote tie souls before that even happens. Prove one another. What can you deal with? What can you what can they deal with? Um, what you're willing to put up with, what they're willing to put up with. Um, they're good. They're bad and they're ugly. You're good. You're bad. and You're ugly. Understand all of that communication is key proper effective respectful considerate communication is key rendering due benevolence love and affection and sex right that's that's needed to have a happy spouse and a happy house people playing their role sisters being coachable sisters being teachable sisters Embracing your role as below your husband and allowing him to leave. Sisters, being submissive and having your desire to your husband. Brothers, being that provider spiritually, emotionally, providing that protection, providing that love and affection, and of course financially, but we know different people have different situations and depending on the household, the the sister may be the breadwinner because in this world they have made it you know so much easier for our sisters to to elevate in that realm but you need to provide in all those other realms brothers spiritually you need to provide that love and affection you need to provide emotional stability emotional security you need to love your wives as your own selves. You need to take into consideration if I don't like people doing this to me, I'm not going to do that to my wife. Even though when when people get mad at me, I don't like when they raise their voice. I, you don't raise your voice. I don't I, I don't like people not being considerate. Then you need to be considerate. I don't like people um, who ignore me. Then you can't ignore your wife when you have an attitude like loving your wife as your own soul, understanding you guys are a reflection of one another and dealing according to to knowledge dealing according to knowledge with one another these are the things that we need to make sure that we are abiding in abide in these things and i promise you you guys will have the godly ordained union and you will have happy spouses and happy homes so that concludes the moral of the story lesson. Do brothers have anything else to add? Um, and also, if anyone has any questions, you guys can start raising your hands.